What a turnout. Wow. Thank you. I want to thank Paul. Boy, I'll tell you. I love tough people. You need tough people, and he's a tough cookie. And when we got his endorsement, we were thrilled, I will tell you that. He's a great guy. Uh, you know, I was doing a little bit of a thing called a debate. All right, get him out, please. Get him out. What are they doing, right? What's the purpose? What are they doing? Well, it gets a little television time, I guess. But, you know, I was going to the debate, and I was going directly in from Florida. I'm down in Florida. We're campaigning. We're doing really well in Florida. We're campaigning against a guy that has the worst voting record in the history of the state of Florida, named Rubio. Um, he's, uh, I call him lightweight. He's a lightweight. But got the worst record in the history of Florida, so I don't know. I should do well there. Let's hope I do well there. I love Florida. But I was, I was going to Detroit, and I said to my people, I have to stop in Maine. I felt so, I just had to stop in Maine. So I wouldn't say that it's a very direct route, would you say? Instead of going this way, I went this way and this way, and that is good. I'm so glad. And you know, to put, to put this incredible sold-out crowd, and you have thousands of people outside, to put this crowd together in a period of, what, 24 hours? is pretty amazing. And Maine is amazing. You know, Maine is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. And people don't realize how large your land mass is. I was talking to Paul. As large as all of New England, when you think of it. That's some piece of land. Can I buy some, please? Can I buy some? Can I buy some? So, you know, I've been watching uh, with great interest as we get to, you know, go down the line. We've had some amazing results. And right nearby with New Hampshire, we, it was an amazing, incredible thing. And by the way, they, every single time I went to New Hampshire, whenever I met with people, they'd always say, number one problem, number one problem, heroin, number one problem. And I'd say, how is that possible? You know, you look at these beautiful fields and the beautiful little roads and everything's so beautiful. And it was the number one problem. And it comes from our southern border. And we're going to close up that border. And we're going to build a wall. And we're going to stop the drugs from coming in. Believe me. We're going to stop. And people are going to come into our country, but they're going to come in legally. They're going to come in legally. But we're going to solve the problem. But, you know, I watch these pundits. And when I first started, my wife Melania and I, we came down the escalator, right? And I first started. And it was an amazing thing. I said, you know, we have to do something because we have people that don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing in running our country. And I got some of that today, you know, just in hearing some of these things. But they don't know what they're doing. We have to do it. And it takes guts to run for president. I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician. All talk, no action, nothing gets done. And anyway, we're coming down. And, and I said to myself, you know, there's so many things. And then I watched the pundits and they said, Oh, Trump, I don't know. We have some great talent running, and I'm trying to figure out where, where, what's the talent? What's the talent? But you know, you come down and you do it, and you start talking about trade, and you see what happens with trade. Uh, trade, has been, trade has been such a disaster. But the pundits all said, you know, I came out at 3%, first one. And my wife said, you know if you run, you're going to win. But you actually have to run. You can't say you're going to run because they won't poll it. But even if they do poll it, people still say you're not going to run. She said, but if you run, you're going to win. I said, oh, she's my pollster. She's my pollster. I paid her less money, but she's, my, she's better than the pollster. So you know what happened? I started at three the first day or something. I was at three, which I wasn't exactly thrilled about. Then it went up to six. It went up to 12. It went up to 18. And then it kept going up. And every time I went up, the pundits would say, he's plateaued, you know, plateaued. Well, he's always going to get six. That's a six solid group. Then I went up to 12. Well, you know, that's a solid group. Then I went up to 24. And he said, and don't forget, that's with 17 people. We had 17 people. That's a lot. 24 with 17 people is pretty good. So we went up to 24. 
And they said, well, that's the max. There can't be any more. Then we went up to 28, 32. So CNN just came out with a poll. Trump, 49. Yeah. National. That's high. That's high. And, and I'm very proud of it because this is not a plateau. This is a movement. We have a movement going on, folks. Time Magazine did a story recently, a couple of weeks ago, talking about what's going on, and, and they've never seen anything like it. People have never seen anything. They say, actually, and I don't think I'm exaggerating this at all, and I don't want to exaggerate, but many of the great writers, of which there are very few, because the media is among the most dishonest people I've ever dealt with. <laughs> but they said, they said that in the history of this country, there's never been anything like this, what's happening. We were in Huntsville, Alabama the other day. We had 35,000 people, 35,000 people. We were, we went to Arkansas, which you saw we went. Oh, is that another one? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, get them out. Get them out. Get them out. Uh, they just don't stop. All right, get them out. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Terrible. Incredible. Now, you know, you can be nice, but if you're nice, they'll say, oh, you were so soft. Yeah. Then you can be vicious. Get out of here, right? And then they'll say you were too harsh. So I've developed a nice, all right, please get them out. <laughs> it's incredible. I love you too. I love you too. I love you too. And by the way, you know, I'm self-funding my campaign. I'm putting up all my money. I'm not, but, but you have to do all I want. I don't want your money. I just want one thing. You vote on Saturday. Get out and vote. Don't forget, I did that big, long turn. Slightly long. It did a big turn. So you can get out to vote, okay? That's the least you can. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So, our country and our theme is Make America Great Again. And over the last little while, I've met so many people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We have like this. Now, this is, we're only confined by the size of the room. This is packed, but this is the size of the room. Thousands and thousands of great, great Americans. And I have more confidence in this country now than I've ever had before. I have seen, I mean, millions of people, really, because when you get 35, 40,000 people for rallies, uh, and we have by far the biggest rallies, I will say that. Bar and Bernie is second, he's second, but he's a distant second, but he is second, I have to give him credit for that. But we have by far the biggest, and I see by far the most people, and this country has unbelievable people that love our country, just remember that. And I want to see the day in the not too distant future when Apple makes their iPhones in this country and not in China and all of these other places. Now, I heard, and I saw just a little bit of it, but I heard that Mitt Romney made a fairly long speech. And, and I mean, honestly, I thought I'll just address it quickly because it's irrelevant. Look. Mitt is a failed candidate. He failed. He failed horribly. The third debate... <laughs> he failed badly. That was a race, I have to say, folks, that should have been won. That was a race that absolutely should have been won. And I don't know what happened to him. He disappeared. He disappeared. And I wasn't happy about it, I'll be honest, because I am not a fan of Barack Obama, and that was a race. And I backed Mitt Romney. I backed him. You can see how loyal he is. He was begging for my endorsement. I could have said, Mitt, drop to your knees. He would have dropped to his knees. He was begging. Sure. Sure. He was begging me. And did you see how great, he said, oh, I'm not big like him. He's the great businessman, all that stuff. Well, since then, I'm, I've done much better. And now he tries to demean, but we'll talk about that in a second. But Mitt was thinking about running again. He ran a horrible campaign. It was a campaign that should have never been lost. You're running against a failed president. He came up with the 47%. He demeaned 47% of the people in our country, right? The, four, the famous 47%. Once that was said, I'll be honest, once that was said, a lot of people thought it was over for him. Then the last month and a half, he disappeared. Yeah. 
And I called his people. I said, you have to do yourself a favor. Obama, say what you want. He was on Jay Leno. He was on David Letterman. He was all over the place the last three, four weeks. Mitt was looking for zoning for a nine-car garage or something in California, <laughs> right? I said, what's he doing? Who cares about a garage? You're running for president. And Mitt was a disaster as a candidate. So what happened, and it was very strong, and I think if the press goes back, they'll see it. When I heard he was running again, and I wasn't sure I was going to be running, but I was very, very strong to Mitt and to everybody, and publicly, not to talk to him, because I didn't even want to talk to him. I was so disappointed in him. Because he let us down. He let us down. You know, it's one thing you lose, and you work, and you work, and you go. He let us down. He should have won. Something happened to him. He went away. He was gone. He was horrible in the third debate. It was, it was a horrible, something happened. I don't know what happened. Maybe someday they'll write a book. His campaign guy was terrible, terrible. He had a terrible campaign manager who's always on television, uh, Stuart Stevens or something. He's always on television knocking everybody. The guy ran one of the worst campaigns in the history of modern politics. And Mitt ran, probably it was the worst run that most people have seen because most people thought that the Republican candidate would win. So when Mitt started raising his head a few months ago, I was very strong. I said, Mitt Romney should not run. He's a choke artist. And I said it very strongly. I wanted to keep him in. And then Jeb Bush actually convinced Mitt not to run. Can you imagine? Jeb, Jeb sold him. Jeb, he's a good salesman. See, now that he's out, I'll say Jeb's a good salesman, right? He's a high energy salesman. But Mitt was afraid of Jeb because he was afraid that Jeb would get the money and Jeb would get the whatever. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid of Jeb, I can tell you that. So what happened is Jeb Bush convinced Mitt not to run. Mitt was going to run. It was going to be a third attempt, the second one being one of the great catastrophes. The first one just didn't happen, so that's okay. But the second was a catastrophe. And what happened is he went to see Jeb, and Jeb had him convinced that he's going to run, he's got the money, he's this, and Mitt chickened out. But I'll tell you the real reason he chickened out. It wasn't Jeb, it was me. Because I said, he's a joke. If you remember, Mitt was all set to run. I know this from people that are close to him. And I think he probably still has a desire, maybe at the convention, to try and get some kind of a thing. Hillary Clinton will destroy him in the election. Assuming she's allowed to run, assuming she's not arrested for the email situation. Which is so terrible. Which is so terrible. I mean, so terrible. But let's assume that the Democrats are going to protect her. Let's assume that I will be running against Hillary, and I really want to. I would love to run against Hillary. And by the way, we have numerous polls that show me beating her easily, and I haven't even started on her yet other than four weeks ago I did. Remember? She called me sexist, and I hit her with the husband, and that was the last time I ever heard the word sexist. That was it. No, that was it. They had a rough weekend. That was a rough weekend. Bill was not happy. He, I, I guarantee you, he said, don't you ever say that to him again. Say it to somebody else, but not to Trump. That was a rough, rough weekend they had. But Mitt was going to run as sure as you're standing here. I'm sorry we didn't get you to see it's too many people. But he was going to run, and I was very, very uh, angry that he was going to run. I didn't even know I was going to be doing this. but. I felt I wanted to. You know, NBC came to me, they wanted to extend the, the Apprentice for two seasons, 28 episodes. Steve Burke, now Steve Burke of Comcast, great guy, came up to my office with the people at NBC. Please, Donald, we'd like you to run. We'd like you to, you know, not run. We'd like you to run in The Apprentice, do The Apprentice. The ratings after 14 seasons were still fantastic. They were still great. And I said, Steve, I think I'm going to run for president. No, 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 you're not, you're not. No, I think I'm going to run for president. They didn't want me to. They wanted me to because the show does great. And ultimately, I decided to run, and you're not allowed by law. With equal time laws, you're not allowed to do both. And we chose Arnold Schwarzenegger. Let's see, how will Arnold do, by the way? Does anybody know? Who would be better, Arnold or Trump? Ready? Arnold? Trump. Well, we're going to find out if Arnold is quick, because if he's not quick, he's not going to look good. When you have Omarosa and all the other ones coming at you, you got to be quick. you got to be smart. We'll find out. We're going to learn a lot about Arnold, but I hope he does well. I hope Arnold does really well. But I was going to do that, and they, they, I mean, they actually renewed the show with me 
in the upfronts. And uh, I, just, I just said, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. And I gave up a lot of deals. I gave up a lot of things. To do this takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. Oh, those are the people trying to get in. Can you believe it? Yep. Okay, how about everybody now clearing out, we'll let a new group in. Is that okay? No? So anyway, so when I heard Mitt was going to run, a little before this period of time, I was very tough. I said, he can't run, he can't run. He was going to run. He can't run. Then I started saying, look, we got to keep him out because he's going to lose. He's a choke artist. He's an absolute, and I started hitting him so hard. In fact, people say, why'd you hit him so hard? Because we cannot take another loss. We can't take another loss. And Mitt is indeed a choke artist. He choked, and he choked like I've never seen anyone choked, other than Rubio, when Chris Christie was grilling him. That was one of the great chokes. Oh, no. Rubio of Florida, that was one of the great chokes I've ever seen. He was standing there shaking, sweating. I was getting ready. I'm standing here like this. He's right over here. I'm getting ready to grab him, because I thought he was going down. I'm telling you. But Mitt did a big, big choke, and uh, we had to keep him out. So look, a couple of things I heard he said. Uh, first of all, you know, he doesn't mention the fact that I built a city on the west side of Manhattan, that I built buildings all over Manhattan. He didn't mention any of this, that he was talking about a beef, and he talked about a water company, which, by the way, I still have. I supply all my clubs with the water. You know, numerous of those things I have, the magazine, other things. Get him, get him out of here. Get him out. Get him out. Hey, by the way, speaking of Mexico, I won the Hispanic vote by far in Nevada, right? We won, we won the Hispanic vote in Nevada in the, in the polls uh, during the... We won Nevada, we won South Carolina, we won New Hampshire. Then we had the big, big Tuesday where we won a tremendous number. And, and I have to tell you this. So, ultimately, Mitt chickened out. And now he's saying probably sees Hillary is very weak. And now he said, oh, I wish I went, I wish I tried it. But ultimately he didn't, because he would have gotten, he would have gotten beaten very badly. But I'll tell you what, a couple of things were mentioned that we have to discuss. First of all, when he talks about me, I wrote just a couple of them down. When he talks about me, they don't want to talk about 92-story uh, buildings all over the place. They don't want to talk about the Bank of America building in San Francisco, 1290 Avenue of the Americas. They don't want to talk about the West Side Railroad Yards, where I built a city on the west side of Manhattan, a tremendous city on the west side of Manhattan. They don't want to talk about 40 Wall Street and all the buildings. They want to talk about water, which I still have. I supply all my clubs. I have a water company. They want to talk about a magazine, and I have a magazine. It goes to all my clubs. They want little tiny thing, you know, wherever you can find. By the way, a school, little deal, but very, you know, I loved it in, when it was there. Trump, they call it Trump University, Trump uh, Initiative. But I will tell you, just so you understand on the school, the school had 98% approval rating. But you had an attorney that felt, oh, maybe I can sue Trump and get something. The school had a 98%. In other words, 98% of the people that took the courses, we signed report cards. That's why you can't settle a case like that. You put somebody up in the stand. Did you write this? The most beautiful thing. They did a commercial, they took it down, where two people were going and saying negative, and then we showed them the statement that they wrote, they had to take the commercial down. Because 98% of the people that took the course, that took the courses, said really wonderful things about it. The other thing's got an A, an A from the Better Business Bureau. So I say, how do I settle a case like this? Uh, a B plus would be okay too. B plus would be okay, but we did better than a B plus. So, so I can't, and, and here's one thing I say about business. I watch these bankers. And they get millions of dollars a year, 40, 50 million dollars. Frankly, it's ridiculous. And then they'll settle with the government if they're sued by the government for 2 billion, 3 billion, 5 billion, 12 billion. And I say to them, why don't you fight it? They said, well, it's the government, we don't want to fight. Well, I say, you got to fight it because if you don't fight it, everyone's going to sue you. And that's what happens. You ever see it? They settle for 2 billion, the next week they get sued again. You got to fight these things out. You have to do things, you have to do what's right. So with university, I knew I could get some bad publicity done, but I have, to, I have to do what's right. Do we agree with that, by the way? So it's, it's a very small case, it's a civil case, it's not a big deal, and I'm gonna win it in court, and it'll cost me more money to win it in court than I could settle for, in my opinion, but I'm gonna win it in court. And I said, oh, this is lousy timing, because it's too bad it wasn't a little bit later, because I happened to be running for president, 
But I have other suits too. Any businessman or businesswoman has lawsuits. People sue to get their money back. They sue for this, they sue for that. They sue for a million different reasons. So just so you understand, 98% approval rating, an A from the Better Business Bureau. We're gonna win the case, mark it down. We're gonna win the case. Uh, it'll be forever because it takes forever. But that's the way it is. I don't like to settle cases. I don't like to do it because once you settle cases, what happens is everybody says he's a settler, let's sue. That's not me. A lot of people don't sue me because they say it's too hard. So, so one of the things, one of the things that Mitt brought up, which I think is so serious, he said about trade. We have to keep trade. Nobody knows more about trade than me. I mean, I made so much more money than Mitt. You know, I have a store that's worth more money than Mitt. It's a store. And actually, it was funny because I made that statement jokingly when I was in Iowa. And the Des Moines Register, a paper that's actually a terrible paper, if you want to know the truth. But they called up, they said, oh, that's a terrible statement. That's a terrible statement for you to make that statement about. And the people put me on, I said, what are you saying? They said, you said you have a store that's worth more than Mitt. So let's say Mitt's worth 150 or 200 million dollars. I said, what's he worth? They said, 150 million dollars. I said, yeah, the store's worth much more than him. It's on Fifth Avenue, you know, it's good. Gucci, the Gucci store. So I said, yeah, it's worth much more. We don't believe a store is worth 150 million. I said, well, go ahead, go get a couple of, they actually went out, got three appraisers, and they said, you know what, that store is worth from 400 million to a billion too. And, and by the way, this isn't me talking. You can go check your local Des Moines register if anybody, if it's still open. I'm not sure it's still open. <laughs> but anyway, but, but I built an amazing company. And you know, one of the reasons you know it's amazing, the hottest, development, the hottest development site, probably in the history of the General Services Administration, the GSA, that's the government service, is the old post office site. That's where the post office is built in Washington, D.C., an entire block fronting on Pennsylvania Avenue. In other words, if I don't get there through the White House, I'm getting there anyway, okay, folks? And fronting on Pennsylvania Avenue, the, one of the most beautiful buildings in the country, and incredible, it's a landmark building. And the GSA for many, many, many years has owned it, and they've wanted to develop it for 30, 35 years, and it just sort of never worked out, big job, and never happened. And then they went to bid. And in bidding it, they had more bidders and more high-level bidders, I think, than they ever had before. So let's assume just about, it's just about the hottest job that they've ever put out to bid. Every hotel company wanted it. I actually got it on build, building a 300 room, super, super luxury hotel. But they bid it and every hotel company, every office company, everybody wanted it. So they went out to a public bid. And one of the things in choosing the bidder was how strong is the bidder and how good is the bidder's idea. Well, they loved my idea because what we're going to do, I'm serious, this will be one of the great hotels of the world. It is now two years ahead of schedule. It's going to open in September. We're supposed to open up in September in two years. We're two years ahead of schedule. And by the way, the GSA people are terrific people. And we're under budget a little bit. In fact, the only reason we're only a little bit under budget is that I'm using marble instead of terraza. Not a bad idea, right? So, et cetera, a lot of different things. But we're going to the super end, the highest end. And the reason I got chosen was, number one, my financial statement was so strong that it could guarantee completion because they didn't want to have a mess where they build 25 percent, then it goes out of business. And number two, we had the best idea. So when I listened to this myth, and by the way, this is in the Obama administration, in all fairness. I wouldn't say I had an advantage. In fact, I said to my daughter, she was very much involved with that, I said, you know, maybe, maybe we're not going to get it no matter how good we do. But my financial statement is so strong, and I, by the way, put it in, you know, where Romney talks about taxes, right? Why is he doing his taxes? Maybe this. You don't learn anything from, very little do you learn from taxes, very little. You know, you look at a tax sheet, you can't learn very much. But I did file uh, almost 100 pages of financial statements with the federal elections. And it shows that I have a net worth that could be over $10 billion, probably over. And I don't want to do that in a bragging way. I tell you because that's the kind of thinking we need. We have 19 trillion, as Paul was saying, 19 trillion dollars in debt. It's the kind of thinking we need. I have very low debt. I have tremendous cash flow. It's an unbelievable company that I've been. And I filed my financials. So when he says, oh, maybe there's something in his tax return, there's nothing. But I get audited every single year. And because the company is so big, they audit, I understand, Fortune 500 companies every year. Because my company is so big, or some other reason, which is unfair, 
But because my company's so big, let's leave it at that. They audit me every year. I think it's very unfair that they audit me every year, but I've been audited every year for many years. Now, when the audit's finished, I'll release my tax returns. I have nothing, but I don't want to do it. And nobody in this room would say, you're being audited, and here's the tax return. You get audited, you finish up the audit, routine stuff, you finish, and then you release the tax returns. But if anybody wants to, like Mitt, would like to go down and go to the federal election office, you'll see almost 100 pages of financials that were filed ahead of schedule. I could have delayed it for six months. I filed them within 30 days. And believe me, I had to work hard with the accountants. The accountants worked overtime because I didn't want them saying, oh, he's asking for extensions. So that's really the, the thing. So with Mitt, I just wanted to tell you that he came out, it was very nasty. I mean, I thought he was a better person than that. I did help him, I raised money for his campaign. I actually had two fundraisers for him. In fact, the first fundraiser was so successful that we had the second one that same day. His wife, who was a lovely woman, by the way, a really lovely woman, she came up. We had a fundraiser in my apartment at Trump Tower, and it was so oversubscribed. I did a great job. They couldn't have cared less about him. In fact, a lot of them said, Donald, He's a stiff, he's not gonna win. I said, oh, he'll be fine. He's a stiff, I should have listened to the guy. But we had a fundraiser and it was so big and it was raining out, I won't forget this one. I was raining and really raining. It was a miserable, miserable day. And the people came in, hundreds of people, phase one. And then we said, there's too many people to put them in one. So we called for another one an hour later, after it ended one hour. And because everybody's shoes were so wet, I ruined my carpet. That's why I ruined This carpet was wiped out. And nobody thanked me for the carpet. Hey, maybe I can send Mitt a bill for carpet ruined, right? But I always, you know, when you help somebody, when you help somebody, he asked me to make robocalls. I made six robocalls for him. Every single place I made the robocall, he won. North Carolina, there were six different places. So you help somebody, and then, he turns. Now, I will say this. I will say this. I will say this. Uh, he probably had a right to turn because nobody could have been nastier than me in getting him not to run by saying he's a joke artist. And I will say the reason I did that, he was going to run. I love our country too much. If he would have run, and even if he would have won, it would have been bad. He doesn't have what it takes to be president. That I can tell you. He doesn't have what it takes to be president. So, I, I do want to mention one thing, because it worked so well, because his speech was long and they covered so much territory, it was ridiculous. Uh, and, and you're right, he didn't mention any of the many, many, many buildings. We're building now over 120 jobs, and in the works, over 120 jobs all over the world. We just got Turnbury in Scotland, one of the great places of the world. Doral, where they're having the tournament today, by the way, they're having the World Golf Championship today. And I'm in Maine, I'm in Maine with you. I don't know. Rory and Rory McElroy, everybody's down there. And uh, Tiger's going there later to look, he's gonna be better, he's gonna be fine. But they're all there, they're all at my place, and here I am making a speech in Maine. Okay, see? So if I don't win on Saturday, I'll say, boy, was that a mistake, right? Anyway, I think we will. But, but I will say this, look, trade. He talked about domestic. Bye-bye. 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 Get him out. Get him out. I love you, too. These people. I'll tell you what, your police are fantastic. Uh, do we love our police? Do we love our police? Where would we be without them, in all fairness? They are so abused, and you know, one stupid incident or bad incident, or if there's one bad person, which happens out of the whole country, and it's the biggest story in the news, and it plays forever. And people don't realize how great a job the police of this country do, I have to tell you, so. So one of the things that Mitt was talking about was domestic policy and we need trade and we need trade and we have to deal with China, we have to deal with all these people. Look, last year, in terms of a trade deficit, we lost with China $500 billion, okay? We lost with Mexico. That's why Mexico is going to pay for the wall, folks. Mexico, look, the wall, we need actually, it's, it's 2,000 miles. 
we're going to pay, we need 1,000 because we have a lot of natural barriers. Just so you understand, wall's going to cost $10 billion. It's an expensive wall. That's going to be a Trump wall, I'll bring it in under budget ahead of schedule too, by the way. But it's going to be, an, I have to name it after myself because maybe, you know, like, should I name it after myself? I don't think so. We want more than a wall. But we're going to have a real wall and it's going to be a great wall and it's going to work and we're going to stop drugs from pouring into Maine and New Hampshire and all these places. It's going to work. Believe me, it's going to work. Walls work. Properly done, walls work and it's going to happen. But, but just so you understand, they come up to me and they say, but Mexico will never pay. The politicians, people that are on the dais with me. But Donald, Mex first they said there's no wall, right? You can't build a wall. How can you build a wall? China built a wall that's 13,000 miles long 2,000 years ago. We can't do one that's 1,000 miles, right? Believe me, we can. So now they realize that. And the other day I hear this guy Cruz saying, we can't build a wall. And then I hear him saying, we're going to build a wall. And my wife came, darling, could you come back and listen to this? We're going to build a wall. First time I heard him say that. And I don't know if Rubio said it. I think Rubio's got bigger problems than worrying about walls. But, but now all of a sudden they're, they're talking about walls. But here's the thing. We have with Mexico a $58 billion trade deficit. If the wall costs $10 billion, that's a tiny fraction. If the wall costs $10 billion, I guarantee you folks that Mexico is going to pay for the wall, just as sure as you're standing there. Now, a politician wouldn't say that. And you saw this Vincente Fox, the previous president, who, by the way, threw a horrible word out. He threw the F word out, okay, the F bomb. He threw the F bomb. Can you imagine if I used that word? Man, that would be a big story. That would be all over the world. He threw it out, nobody cares. And then we had our vice president apologize to him. Now look, I love Mexico, I love the Mexican people. I have many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Mexican people. Thousands over the years, thousands have worked for me. The Hispanics are phenomenal people. I told you, I won the, I won the poll in Nevada. These are phenomenal people. I won Nevada and I won with the Hispanics, which is so good, right? So good. But, but look, here's the problem. Their leaders are too smart for our leaders. We're getting killed at the border. We're getting killed on trade. Nabisco is moving in from Chicago. They're closing their big plant. They're moving in. Uh, you look at Ford. Ford's building a massive, massive car complex there. That means they're closing places in Michigan, great places, Michigan and other places, and they're closing and they're going to Mexico. Can't let that happen. The other day, Carrier announced air conditions. I buy Carrier air conditions. They're good air conditions. I'm not buying them anymore. They announced 1,400 men and women are being laid off and somebody had the tel cell phone going, right? A lot of you saw that. Big, big story. 1,400. And this manager was, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are closing our plan. We're moving to Mexico. Bye-bye. He was pretty tough for, this was not a guy with social grace, believe me. So they're going to move to Mexico. So here's what we have to do, folks. Mitt Romney said, we have to keep free trade. Right? Well, if we keep free trade the way we have it now, we're not going to have any companies left at all. And you people know more about NAFTA than anybody, okay? Anybody, because you know how you were stripped with NAFTA, which was a disaster. But we're going to do something much different. We're going to be smart people now, okay? I built a tremendous fortune. And believe me, I started off with very little. You know, they like to say, oh, my father, my father. If my father would have given me 200 million, in fact, my sister and brother called me up. They said, Don, what are they kidding? These people are such liars. I borrowed a tiny amount of money, started something, and now it's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. And I will tell you something, with, with the, with the uh, carrier plant, what you have to do is you have to be smart. So this isn't free trade. We have to have smart trade. China charges tremendous tariffs and taxes when you want to sell. I have a friend who's a manufacturer. He makes great product. He puts it into China, they send it back. Puts it in again, they send it back. A third time, they take it, but he has to pay a tremendous tax. He sees me, he goes, oh, Donald, you have no idea how tough it is to negotiate with China. They don't want the product, and when they take the product, they charge you a tax. That's not the way it's supposed, that's not free trade. Now, China, when they sell their product to us, no tax. Come on in, folks. Take our jobs, everything else. No tax, no nothing. Not going to work that way. Mexico, the same thing. So Ford goes out, builds this $2.5 billion plant. They're going to make cars, trucks, and parts, right? And they're going to send them into our country. No tax. Where is that good for us? So when I watch a guy like like Romney, who truly is a lightweight. When you watch a guy like Mitt Romney, no, no, think of it. He's talking about trade. And I love free trade. I am a free trader. You know, a lot of the conservatives, they say, 
Donald Trump does not like free trade. Isn't that terrible? I want smart trade. I want trade where at least there's an even balance, right? I don't want to be losing, I don't want to be losing $500 billion a year. I don't want to be losing $58 billion a year. I want to make money or I want to break even at worst, okay? So, so I tell people, if you had, like, a lightweight Rubio as president, he would, he, he's all controlled by the special interests, 100 percent. He gets all his money. I'm, remember, I'm self-funding. They're not paying me anything. So he gets his money. If you have a guy like Ted Cruz getting a lot of money from a lot, from oil and other places, okay? So, I mean, honestly, that's the way life works. So what happens is oil, 100 percent. They'll get a lobbyist that took care, 100%. They're not going to do anything. Me, it's different. So here's what I do. Tell Carrier, tell Ford, tell whoever wants to listen. And it's the only way you can do it, folks. The only way we're going to stop this tremendous outflow of companies is the following. And by the way, Pfizer, great, great, massive company, drug company, pharmaceutical company, leaving, going to Ireland. Wonderful. That's wonderful. But you're not going to take advantage of us, okay? You're not going to take advantage of us. So here's what happens. Let's use Carrier as an example. I know it's not presidential. In fact, my wife called just before. She said, darling, would you please react presidentially? Be presidential. <laughs> like you were the other night when you had all those victories. You stood on the stage and everybody liked it. I said, yeah, but I have incoming. When you have incoming, you can't be too presidential. You have to, right? Does that make sense? I said, I have incoming. So, so here's what happens. There's a lot of truth to that. They said, act presidential tonight. I said, I'll act presidential, but if somebody hits me, I'm going to hit them back harder. Right? right? So, so what happens, you know, it's one of those things. So what happens is, is they will not do anything because the lobbyists will call, say, you cannot do anything to carry, you cannot do anything to Ford. And they'll say, oh, okay, they gave you a $2 million contribution or a $5 million contribution. You can't touch them. They've been very loyal to you. They've been very good. And they'll go, all right, okay, good. That's the end of that, right? All those jobs gone. Here's what I do. I call up, and I'd like to use one of my guys. You know, Carl Icahn, great businessman, he endorsed me. Many of the great businessmen endorse me, and women. I have a lot of endorsements from business. I'd announce them, except nobody cares. But these are the most important people, in a sense, because I will use the greatest minds. We have the greatest business people, the greatest negotiators in the world. But I, this is so easy. I want to sort of do it myself. But it's so unpresidential for me to be calling up Carrier. I'm the President of the United States. And I call up. I say, hi, Donald Trump, President of the United States. I hope... I hope you enjoy your stay in Mexico. I hope you build a beautiful, beautiful factory, beautiful plant. And I really want to wish you well. But let me just tell you something. You moved out. You heard 1,400 people. These people were devastated, by the way. I watched it. And they've done a great job. You've heard 1,400 people. And there's no free trade because it's a totally imbalanced. I mean, their politicians are so much sharper and smarter and streetwise than ours. I said, here's the story. Every air conditioning unit that you make and every single air conditioning unit that you make and comes across the border into the United States, we're going to charge you a 35% tax, okay? 35% tax. And that's it. Now, here's what happens, okay? As sure as you're standing here, look, they're going to call their lobbies. Oh, you got to speak to the president. You got to, but they can't speak to me. I didn't take any of their money. I don't want their money, right? So that's not going to work. Here's what's going to happen. As sure as you're here, they're going to call me up within 24 hours. They're going to say, Mr. President, do you have any second thoughts? I say, absolutely not. They say, sir, we've decided to stay in the United States. That's it. Very simple. We've decided. Now, we can be cute or we can say we're coming up with all, you know, in Washington, they're playing around with all sorts of formulas. There is no formula. That's the formula. So when Mitt made the statement, he said, he will ruin free trade. Ruin free trade. If I'm losing $505 billion with China, if I'm losing $58 billion a year with Mexico in, in terms of deficits, what do I want that kind of trade for anyway? Ruin it. Who needs that kind of trade? Seriously, who needs that kind of trade? Now, Mitt admitted that I'm a much better businessman than him, and I am. I'm a much, much, much better businessman than him. We will actually have better relationships with Mexico. We will have better relationships with China. They'll respect us. They don't respect us now. They think we're the dumbest people on Earth, led by the world's dumbest people. Now, look, look, let me just tell you something. China, in the, in the South China Sea, is building a massive military fort with runways and a tremendous complex. They're not supposed to be doing that. 
They didn't tell us. They have no respect for our country. With me, I'll cut, I'm going to rip up those trade deals and we're going to make really good ones. And by the way, we have the cards. Just so you understand, remember I wrote The Art of the Deal, which is, in all fairness, I think the number one selling business book of all time. But, but just remember this. We have the cards. We have rebuilt China with the money they've taken out of our country for many years, in all fairness. We have, I call it the greatest single theft in the history of the world, what China has done to our country. You go to China, they have trains that go 300 miles an hour. We have trains that go chug, 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 and then they have to stop because the track split, right? They have trains that go 300 miles an hour. They have trains, Japan, China, a lot of countries. We have, we're living, we're like third world. We're, you go to our airports, you go to LaGuardia, you land and you go to Dubai, and you go to Qatar, and you go to different places in Asia, and you see airports like you've never seen. Then you come home, you land at Kennedy, you land at LAX, you land at LaGuardia, oh, LaGuardia with the potholes all over the place, okay? I mean, it's, it's just a very sad thing, what's happened. What's happened to our country is very, very, very sad. So we're gonna make it a lot better, and we're gonna make it different, and we're gonna get rid of those horrible trade deals, because uh, let me tell you, at some point, it's gonna burst. At some point, we can't continue to lose $500 billion with individual countries. We can't continue, you add it up, whether it's India, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's anybody, every single country in the world that deals with us takes advantage of the stupidity of the United States, and a lot of it is because they have the right lobbyists, they have the right negotiators, they hire the right people on Pennsylvania Avenue. We have, they have the right people. And they're negotiating with hacks, political hacks. Not our best people, almost our worst people. So we're going to make our country so strong. We're going to make it strong militarily, very, very strong. You know, our military is very depleted. Our military is depleted, very badly depleted. And everything, sort of the whole country is depleted. And we're going to make our military strong. We're going to take care of our vets. Our vets are treated horribly, horribly. We're going to get rid of Obamacare, and we're going to repeal it and replace it. We're going to bring education local. We're getting rid of Common Core, which is a disaster. You know, in the world, in the world, educationally, of the 30 countries that they look at, we're number 30 in education, meaning we're the worst. And yet, per student cost, we're number one by far. Number two doesn't even exist. It's so far back. Number one. So we're number one in cost, number one, and we're number 30 in terms of success. So we're, number, we're ranked the worst, and yet we spend the most, okay? And part of that is Common Core. It's terrible. Part of it's a lot of other things. Part of it's theft and incompetence and waste and fraud and abuse and everything else. But we're going to straighten it out. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, when I won New Hampshire, they came out with a report. Donald Trump spent two and a half million dollars. And I won't mention names, but other people spent 45 million dollars, okay? I don't think he likes me. Do you agree? Okay. But think of it. Wouldn't it be nice? So I have the lowest expenditure by far, and I have the biggest result by far. Way, way, way number one. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that for our country instead of the other way around? Wouldn't it be nice? So we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do. So, so we are, very simply, we're going to make America great again. We're going to win, win, win. We're going to win so much. You're going to get so tired of winning. You're going to say, please, please, let us have a couple of losses. I will say, no way I'm going to let you have. We're going to make America great again. And you'll say, okay. Thank you very much. I love you. Please go and vote on Saturday. I love you. Thank you.